Hello, history friends, and welcome back to my channel, Historical USA. Here we discover the people, places, and events that have made America. In this episode, we are re-watching some of the missing episodes from YouTube. Long story, if you've seen the other ones, you know why they're missing from YouTube. However, as much as I want to just re-upload them, I can't do that. YouTube does not like that and I will get in bigger trouble than I have been in the past on YouTube. So I don't want to get in big trouble. We're rewatching these. This episode is actually on one of I think the most visionary men in this period, James Oglethorpe. Now, for those of you from Georgia, you may have heard that name before. For those of you not from Georgia, Oglethorpe founded the Georgia colony, the last of the original 13 British colonies and the first 13 states. This episode, we're going to talk about Oglethorpe, his philosophy that was well before its time. He was very progressive for his age. And we're also going to talk about a really unique relationship he had formed with a chieftain named Tomatichi. Uh, again, if you've paid attention in history class and you're from Georgia, you've probably heard those two names before. But we're going to talk a little bit about Tomatichi and just how Georgia's founding was so different from the other colonies that were founded ar around this time. I feel like I'm rambling, so let's get into it. Let's, without further ado, start watching. As James Oglethorpe made his way down Faraday Street on the east bank of the River Fleet in London, he could smell the despair and desperation before he even passed through the gates of Fleet Prison. And it would be his experience there that would inspire him to create the colony of Georgia. <laughs> Fleet Prison was one of the oldest and most notorious prisons in London. Built in 1197, the prison had a long, infamous, and torrid past. It was originally constructed to hold political prisoners and those held in contempt of the court. She would be rebuilt for the first time after she was destroyed during a peasant revolt in 1381. In the 15th century, it became a prison for those held on civil matters rather than criminal. The prison was actually considered a luxury in those days. Inmates had to pay for board and lodging, and they could tip the guards and pay a fee to enter and leave the prison. There was even an option for the type of prison cell you received based on what you could afford from private rooms to inmates who slept on the floor. The poor in this prison was known to beg through a grate for money, something to make their life a little better. As you passed by, you could hear the cries of alms for the poor, alms for the poor. In 1666, the prison would be destroyed for a second time during the Great Fire of London. On the third day of this catastrophic event, the flames had reached the prison walls, and the warden had waited until the last possible moment to allow his prisoners to flee the flames. Once the prison was rebuilt, fleet was used mainly for debtors and bankrupts. Under normal circumstances, the prison could be bearable. That was until the office of the warden was filled by a man named Thomas Bambridge. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Thomas Bambridge, but one of the things that I get questioned about the most from followers, whether it is on YouTube or social media, just on social media in general, is the concept of debtor's prison. Like I've had a few of you ask me to do a video on debtor's prisons and what that meant. Uh, because who goes to prison nowadays for debt or for having to file bankruptcy? So that's such a foreign thing in our minds. So let me know if you want me to do like a more in-depth video on what debtors prisons were like and what landed you there. Because we've had a lot of famous people in debtors prison. Uh, Pilgrim's Promise was written in debtors prison. Uh, we had a sitting Supreme Court justice sit in debtor's prison for half of the time that he was also sitting on the bench in the Supreme Court. 
we've had congressmen sit in debtor's prison while holding office. So we've had, um, it's kind of interesting how many, you know, today, if you had to go to debt for, if you had to go to prison for debt, like, I don't know, you'd have to arrest most of the country, I think. But it is such a foreign concept to us. And those prisons were horrible. You did not want to go into debt if you could not pay your debt in 1728. The same year, James Oglethorpe's good friend, Robert Castle, was jailed in Fleet because of his debts. Now, Thomas Bambridge was not a good guy. He was cruel and atrocious to the prisoners under his care. As Oglethorpe walked through the prison to visit his friend, he noticed the decay, despair, and neglect of Fleet Prison and the inmates within. He promised he would get Robert out of such deplorable conditions. Oglethorpe, a young MP to Parliament, convinced the House of Commons to appoint a committee to investigate into the state of the goals of the kingdom, which had been for a long time a disgrace to the country. On the 28th, the chairman reported to the House that Bambridge had treated the order of its committee with contempt, and it was thereupon ordered that he should be taken into custody. On March 20th, the report of the committee was read, and it was resolved by the House that Thomas Bambridge, the acting warden of the prison of the fleet, hath willfully permitted several debtors of the crown in great sums of money, as well as debtors to divers of his majesty's subjects to escape, hath been guilty of the most notorious breaches of his trust, great extortion, and the highest crimes and misdemeanors in the execution of his said office, and hath arbitrarily and unlawfully loaded with iron, put into dungeon, and destroyed prisoners for debt under his charge, treating them in the most barbarous and cruel manner, in high violation and contempt of the laws of this kingdom. An act was then passed to enable the king to grant the office of warden to some other person, and to incapacitate Bambridge from enjoying the office of any other whatever. Unfortunately, though, Oglethorpe would fail to save his friend Robert Caswell, who would die in Fleet Prison. Horrified by the abuse that he had witnessed in these prisons, Oglethorpe became an advocate for prison reform in England. He would continue the investigation into the prisons in England, and because most of those in debtors' prison were poor, Oglethorpe began to pay more attention to the plight that the poor had to suffer in England. He wanted to give the poor a chance to give them a new start and felt that the best way to do that would be to create a new colony in America. But there was also a second reason that the British wanted to establish another colony in the South. South Carolina was becoming incredibly important. It was providing the crown with much needed resources and cash. However, after signing the Treaty of Utrecht, the relationship between England and Spain was strained. With the Spanish in Florida and the French in Louisiana, it was becoming more important than ever to create some kind of defensive buffer between the cash colony of South Carolina and England's enemies. The new colony's boundaries included all the land between the Savannah and Altamaha rivers, including much of present-day Alabama and Mississippi. Oglethorpe, excited about the new colony, advertised it in the London papers, calling for poor people to join them on their expedition. You could get a free pass, free land, and all the supplies, tools, and food that you would need for a year. The first shipload of immigrants departed on the ship Anne in 1732, disembarked at Port Royal on the South Carolina coast, and arrived on February 1st, 1733, at the foot of Yamacraw Bluff on the Savannah River, where they built the city of Savannah. One settler wrote, the first house in the square was framed and raised, Mr. Oglethorpe driving the first pin. Oglethorpe envisioned the Georgia colony as an ideal agrarian economy. He hated slavery and welcomed individuals of all religions to live in Savannah, despite the charter's prohibition of Catholics and Jews. Oglethorpe disobeyed this charter prohibition by allowing a group of Jewish individuals to settle in Savannah during the summer of 1733. Now, Savannah was not the first Jews welcomed in the colonies. The Dutch actually had quite a few, um, I'm going to mess this up, Sephardic, Sephardic Jews, I think that's how you say it, Sephardic Jews who immigrated from the Netherlands to New Amsterdam. So when the English take over 
what is now New York, those Jews are still living there and they are still settling there and thriving there. There was all there's also a long history of a Jewish settlement in South Carolina. So Savannah was not the first to be tolerant of the Jews, but it definitely was more welcoming than some of the other colonies. And Haim Solomon was a Jew, uh, considered a founding father and one of the leaders of the Sons of Liberty. In fact, there's an entire movie about him. What is that called? Let me look it up really quick. Oh, I guess it's called Sons of Liberty. It was in 1939. Uh, you can watch the entire movie, I think, here on YouTube. Maybe I should do a maybe I should do a historian reacts to it. Uh, it's quite an old old uh, movie, but yeah. In addition to his tolerance of all religions, Oglethorpe cooperated with and respected the Native American tribes in the area. He developed a connection with the Yamakura Creeks, defended them against traders who sought to exploit them, and settling land disputes via treaties. A 10-acre garden named Trustee's Garden was also created by Oglethorpe to the east of the city. The experimental garden, which belonged to the colony's trustees, was fashioned after the English Botanical and Medicinal Gardens. This garden would include plants used in remedies as well as flora needed to manufacture raw materials for luxury items such as mulberry trees to feed the silkworms that the trustees believed would thrive in Georgia. Oglethorpe also planted oranges, apples, pears, olive, figs, pomegranates, and other fruits that thrived in the warm environment. Yet, the danger from the Spaniards quickly overshadowed the colony's early days. Oglethorpe became more concerned about how he might protect the colony's inhabitants from a Spanish invasion. He regularly requested greater funding from Parliament and the trustees in England to defend the colony. However, Parliament and the trustees frequently did not offer enough money and resources, so Oglethorpe spent his own money to supply what the colony needed. He was aware that if the colony failed, he would lose everything, but he was very optimistic about the outcome. During a visit to England in 1733, Oglethorpe convinced King George to promote him to the rank of colonel in the British Army and grant him a regiment of troops to bring back to Savannah. Oglethorpe had no military experience, but he did obtain a regiment and found himself in command of not just Georgia, but also South Carolina against Spanish soldiers in Florida. Oglethorpe was also very revolutionary in the design of Savannah. The idea was crucial from a military perspective since it would make it easier to protect the city against potential invading native enemies as well as Spaniards. Oglethorpe planned the city around a series of squares with streets laid out in a grid style. Each square was surrounded by a tiny community of colonists and had separate lots allocated to communal structures. Oglethorpe granted 50 acres of land to each of the freemen who came to settle in the new colony. This consisted of a home lot inside the city of Savannah, and five acre garden lot behind the limits of Savannah, and a 45 acre farm lot behind those garden lots. The colonists would often reside on city property, taking advantage of the security that the city had provided, and work their farms and gardens for food and other resources. When Oglethorpe selected Yamakura Bluff as the site of the colony's first settlement, Miko Tamatichi welcomed him and the colonists. Tamatichi was the Miko or chief of the Yamakura Indians. The Yamakura were a small band of Lower Creek Indians that lived in coastal Georgia when Oglethorpe arrived with the colonists. As permanent structures were being erected in the new town of Savannah, Several of the colonists who were sick from the lengthy trip slept in John Musgrove's home in the Yamakroy village. Mary Musgrove was the daughter of a Creek native woman and Edward Griffin, a trader of English origin from Charlestown in the province of Carolina. Her mother died when she was three years old and she was shortly placed in the care of her grandmother and lived with the Creeks until the age of seven when she was brought down by her father from the Creek Nation to South Carolina. There she was baptized, educated, and bred up in the principles of Christianity. After being baptized, her Christian name became Mary. Mary would play an important role as interpreter between Oglethorpe and Tomatichi. 
Tamatichi welcomed the colonists' arrival because it provided a chance for his people to trade with and build diplomatic ties with the English. After the Yamasee War, disagreements over diplomatic contacts with the English and Spaniards drove Tamatichi from the Lower Creeks and onto the banks of the Savannah River. Oglethorpe wished to avoid any issues found in earlier colonies between the English and the natives. Despite having no background or expertise in diplomacy, he was able to establish a good relationship with Tamatichi. Tamatichi visited Oglethorpe in Savannah about a month after the colonists arrived. Tamatichi described how a neighboring tribe had ambushed and killed one of his tribal members, and he requested permission from Oglethorpe to retaliate. Tamatichi admired Oglethorpe and the colonists' presence in Georgia and wanted to ensure that if he attacked the other tribe, that the English did not misinterpret his actions. Tamatichi, his wife Sanuki, their adoptive son Tunahawi, and six Lower Creek tribesmen traveled to London with Oglethorpe in 1734. The chief was searching for promises that his people will benefit from English education and fair trade agreements. Tamatichi and Oglethorpe frequently collaborated and sought guidance from one another. Following the voyage to England, Tamatichi proceeded south of Savannah with Oglethorpe to define the colony's southern boundaries, an essential barrier in the defense of the English colonies against the Spanish to the south. Tamatichi, though, would pass away on October 5, 1739. Because of his help establishing the Georgia colony, Oglethorpe held a military funeral in his honor. The chief's grave was marked, respectively, with a pyramid made of stone. These stones were removed in 1880 and a granite boulder replaced them in 1899. The boulder can still be found in Wright Square in Savannah, along with the copper plaque commemorating Tomatichi. Now, the initial charter handed to the Georgia trustees in 1732 said very little about what religious activities were permitted in the new colony only permitting Catholics from settling and worshiping in the colony. Traditionally, the Spanish were Roman Catholic, and Georgia's founders were concerned that Catholic newcomers might sympathize with Spain if war broke out between the two global powers. Although Catholicism was the only religion explicitly prohibited in the charter, the Georgia trustees also agreed to prohibit Judaism in the new colony. Yet, the hard reality of colonial life allowed Judaism to penetrate Georgia. The colonists in Savannah suffered from heat and disease during their first summer there. And if you've ever been to Georgia, you know how humid it can get. At one time, 60 colonists were critically ill, and it was assumed that they would not survive. Except for Noble Jones, who had fallen ill, there was no actual doctor. Fortunately, a ship carrying Jewish people, including a doctor named Samuel Nunez, arrived unexpectedly. Dr. Nunez set to work curing the sick, and all of them recovered, but the doctor refused payment. Despite the fact that the trustees explicitly prohibited Jews from residing in the new colony, Oglethorpe permitted the group to stay based on the opinion that the charter did grant religious freedom for all non-Catholics. In opposition to his other trustees, Oglethorpe went even further by allowing Jewish immigrants to purchase land in the new colony. They created Temple Mikvee Israel, America's third oldest Jewish congregation and the South's oldest. Oglethorpe spent years building and expanding the colony of Georgia, but it would not be long before war with Spain was imminent. What do you guys think? It was a short one. This was a short episode. Um, Something I find really interesting is I don't really talk a lot about slavery in Georgia. Um, slavery was banned in Georgia in the 1730s. Oglethorpe was very much against slavery. He had worked in the slave trade earlier and saw how deplorable it was and how just heartbreaking it was and did not want that for Georgia. However, South Carolina was a big slave slave colony. Uh, if you wanted to make money, you needed people to work on those plantations. And Georgia had adopted the practice of rice. They wanted to start 
um, growing rice and tobacco and some of these cash crops that made South Carolina very wealthy. And in order to do that, you need labor. And the cheapest labor you could get was unfortunately chattel slavery after the War of Jenkins' Ear, especially. So much to Oglethorpe's disagreeance, the ban on slavery was completely ignored. And just over time, the government in Georgia allowed slavery to exist. And just between the 1740s and the 19th century, within literally a century, slavery becomes a big business in Georgia. It becomes uh, one of the largest slaveholding states. So after the War of Jenkins Ear in 1743, Oglethorpe will leave Georgia and he will never come back. He does not come back to Georgia or um, the American colonies after 1743. Ogle Oglethorpe will get involved in the Jacobite uprising. He will be promoted to a lieutenant colonel, I believe, in the army. Um, and then he is also a member of parliament. So he is busy in London and he will not come back to Georgia. Something, though, that I do find really interesting is when John Adams was in London in 1785, he meets with Oglethorpe twice. Uh, at one point, um, Oglethorpe does express to John Adams his disappointment in the American Revolution and that the two now countries have this kind of friction and conflict. That is something he, he did not like. And he will die a few months after his meeting with John Adams. He will be the only colonial founder to see the colonies become an independent nation before his death. So I do find that really interesting. Um, let me know if I if there is some more interesting things about Georgia that I left out of this episode. Like I said, this was a really short one. I also kind of thought about doing an episode on William Penn, who was also a um, very progressive in his thinking when it came to uh, setting up a society in Pennsylvania. So I was thinking about doing a episode on William Penn. I can still do that if you are interested. I know for me, my family were Huguenots that came over here at the invitation of William Penn. So I might just do a, a video on him because I'm, I'm fascinated with that. Without him, I don't think my family would have left France to settle in Pennsylvania and Maryland. So let me know in the comments below if you would like to see a video on William Penn. I am more than happy to do that. I know that we will talk about William Penn's descendants in a few videos leading up to the American Revolution, but I have not done a specific one on William Penn. So let me know in the comments if you want to see that. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and re-watching this episode. The next episode is all about an ear, the War of Jenkins' ear, which is is a funny name for a war, but it also is kind of called the um, King George's War. We've got a new king, so we've got a new war. So here we, we're going to keep going down this road. I will see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.